Welcome to Let's Chat with Derek. I am your host, Derek Fage, and I have an incredible guest to introduce you to today. She is an award-winning documentary filmmaker. Uh, she's a director and producer uh, and very unique films. Uh, the topics on these films, for many of you, I'm sure you're like, really? You decided to go in that way? You, you took that direction and that path? But let me tell you, that path has brought her to some just exceptional filmmaking. And I had a, a great pleasure of, of uh, interviewing her back when I was hosting Breakfast Television Montreal. Her name is Stacey Tenenbaum from H2L Productions. Stacey, thanks so much for spending time with me. How, how are you? Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, this is the most exciting thing happening in my day. <laughs> that way. Mine too. Uh, yeah, not much going on, I would say. It's, it's been yeah. rough. I'm used to working really hard because I, I run my own company and I do like the job probably of six people. So I'm usually super, super busy. So it's been really difficult for me to sort of ramp down and and yeah, deal yeah. with that yeah yeah and well the pandemic has certainly impacted you like it has many of us and we'll get into that in just a bit but i wanted to go back to you know just how how you began in in filmmaking because i think that in itself is an interesting story yeah i actually started uh right at the bottom as an intern <laughs> uh in television so i started in tv first i was working in kids tv for a long time uh so i kind of did probably every job there is to do. You know, I started as an intern, went into research, ended up, you know, producing and directing. So um, sort of worked my way through the ranks. But mostly my first TV show that I worked on was Popular Mechanics for Kids, which I still oh, cool. quite love and I'm really proud of. Uh, and so then from Kids TV, I went on to do documentary series and, and, and then eventually just started my own company uh, doing feature length films. Yeah. So why the decision to, to go out on your own? Uh, well, I've been doing TV for about 16 years, uh, and it's a really, it's, uh, it's freelance work. So you get hired for a series and then you move on to right. another series and it's extremely grueling work. The, the pace in television is very fast. You sort of have to churn out a show every couple of weeks. Um, I know that feeling. Yeah. It's kind of grueling. And, uh, I was in between contracts, um, cause it's also a contract job. So sometimes the, you know, things dry up and you're in between contracts and that's when I had the idea for my first film. So it really started with, it wasn't that I was going out to, you know, go into my own, start my own production company. It just came with the idea for this film. And then because I had that idea and uh, got a broadcaster that was interested in it, then I decided to start my own company so that I could produce it. And so that film was Shiners, correct? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And this is, uh, as I said, this is really an interesting, unique topic that perhaps a lot of people are like, really? Well, you wanted to, you know, do a film about shoe shiners. Yep. Where did this idea come from? How was it born? Uh, it was actually percolating for a really long time. I lived in India when I just graduated from university, and I started getting my shoe shine there because you know it's, it's dirty and dusty, and I every day have the same shoe shiner. And then I sort of got my shoe shined around the world when I travel. I'd always because I, I really loved getting it done i just thought it was yeah a, it's a great experience great and, and they're I, always I, interesting characters right it's not just yeah. about getting the shoes shined it's about having the conversation with that person because they always have a, a unique story and i always found that uh their energy you know there was just something about the energy that they had yeah, well, they deal with the public, so they kind of got to be hustlers and good talkers. And, uh, you know, they hear and see a lot of interesting things throughout their day. But I think for me, what I thought was, I'm like, wow, this must be the most satisfying profession in the world. Like to take something ugly and in 15 minutes make it like brand new and shiny and make people feel good. I was always like, what a cool job. And nobody uh, other than me really thought it was a cool job. <laughs> so I was kind of like, why is that? Why, like, you know, why don't people think it's a cooler job than it is and so that's kind of what got me started you know what fascinates me too is you know just that job in itself i was saying to a friend the other day that when i was growing up you know one of the things i wanted to be was a doorman I, I did. Um, you know, I, I was very fortunate that my, my dad was a very successful business person. So we got to travel, you know, a decent amount and we got to stay in, you know, some nicer hotels. And that doorman just again, it just happened, you know, the personalities that they had, they were always so friendly. And, you know, you got to meet so many people for somebody like myself that 
was an extrovert, although, you know, I, I did spend a lot of time on my own. I was a creative child as when I was young and, you know, suffering from incontinence, I spent a lot of time on my own, but I loved, I, I, I just, I was passionate about people. I thought, oh my God. So maybe that's your next movie is doorman. Yeah. You know what? Door, I door actually, people, maybe door persons. I, I don't know. I what already had that idea. Strangely really? Enough, but not hotel doorman. I'm really interested okay. in um, New York City uh, apartment doorman. Yes. Because uh, I, I think that. they just Imagine know the stories that everything. <laughs> so I actually had an idea to do that uh, as a film because I think they'd be interesting to interview, uh, and they probably have some great stories. <laughs> Let's go Let's back go to back Steiner's, Steiner's because, because I think, I think what, what I learned, I learned watching the documentary, the documentary is, is how well respected that career, career is in so many, many countries. countries. And, and certainly, certainly I don't think that respect is the same here country. in North America. So, you know, just tell me a little bit how you learned how well respected it was and how much pride that shoe shiners take in different parts of the world. Yeah, well, the reason when I when I first went to develop the film, I wanted to do it in different countries to be able to show that, to be able to show that they are respected differently in different countries. The first country that I looked at, which actually didn't end up in the film, was France. Okay. So in Paris, they have quite a culture of these very, very high-end <laughs> shoe shiners and sort of these people who do patinas on shoes. And so I knew that that world was there, like people uh, that are buying very expensive custom-made shoes are going to, they're taking care of their shoes through these sort of very high-end shoe shiners. So there's a whole world of shoe shiners that is really, really high-end. Because sometimes these people are paying like $10,000 for a pair of shoes. Oh, so you yeah. bring your shoes to anyone to get shine. They need to have the proper care. So it, uh, in the film, I did feature um, a guy in Tokyo who is just, he actually won. There's now a shoe shine competition and he won. Of the course there is. <laughs> There's a competition for everything now. It's so, amazing. So he's the world's best shoe shiner. Um, and then uh, uh, in other countries, like even in the U.S. and Canada, it's seen as more of a menial job. And then I also went to South America, where it's like they're so ashamed to be shoe shiners that they wear these masks. So uh, it's at every level of society. But I wanted to show that that you know it can be a job that is quite prestigious. Well, and then your your next project, which uh, people can see, by the way, we'll we'll talk about that on CBC Gem, uh, the Hot Docs initiative, is is Pipe Dreams. And I was telling you off camera that this one fascinated me as well because when I returned from Montreal to Ottawa full time, um, you know, I had time on my hands. I, I had lost my job, and my wife had been going to this uh, this church, and they were offering, you know, with a goodwill offering of course, to go see classical music. I was like, ah, you know, I'm not really a classical music fan, but you know what? I'll tough it out for an hour, hour and a half. And I was just blown away. I mean, the the amount of talent and, uh, you know, it was a wide variety of different instruments and so forth that I was introduced to. And for yourself, Pipe Dreams is about organists. And I find that fascinating because you never see the organist, Right. You know, yeah. I was at a, you know, as I said, go, went to a church to see, and, you know, if ever you go to a church for service, that you hear that beautiful music, but you never see it. But you were introduced to this in a very unique way. I, I had no idea there was actually a Canadian international organist competition. There is in Montreal. It's world famous, uh, not Montreal famous for some weird reason, because <laughs> it's been going on here since 2008. And I often have people like you that have lived here and been here for a long time being like, oh, I had no idea that happened. But it's a huge festival. It attracts the world's best young organists from around the world. Really, they had like, I don't know, some, like, over 20 countries, maybe even more that were represented at this competition. Wow. Um, and it's amazing. It takes place in three different churches. The final round is at Notre Dame Cathedral, so it's just this beautiful place. Uh, and yeah, and I just got intrigued because I, the reason that it interested me was because I went to the, C, the Canadian International or Organ Competition, which they call CIOC. It's much easier. Yeah. Uh, and so I went to the first CIOC in 2008 because I had a friend who uh, is the artistic director of the festival. Okay. And he invited me, and I was like, oh, organ music, I, uh, two hours. 
word benches. I'm like, Jesus, uh, which I'm not even supposed to swear <laughs> in church. Uh, so I was like, I don't really want to do this, but he was a friend and they were free tickets. And the cool thing about it is they have a screen that shows the organist and them playing. Uh, and I'd never seen an organist play an organ before. And it's amazing to watch because they play a whole keyboard with their feet and then they have four other keyboards and all these pistons that they're pulling in and out. It's, it's, it's insane. It's just, it completely captivated me. And then also I was like, they're young people under 30 who are playing the organ. That's weird. Like, yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> I, when you like, I can see, you know, you know, playing something at home, you know, you pick up the guitar, even the <laughs> violin, right. You may have a piano at home, but Nobody has an organ at home. How do you even practice? Well, that was my next thought. I was like, how do you become good at this? Because obviously it's fiendishly difficult. I mean, it's just like yeah. when you watch it being played, you're like, how does anyone do this? It must take a ton of practice. And then I'm like, I had the same reaction. Like, how do you become good at doing this? How do you practice it? And they actually end up in churches at night. <laughs> alone in okay. churches at night a lot um which is kind of cool so we did a lot of filming in these huge cathedrals just like completely empty at nighttime which is really special actually so uh that was that was kind of a cool part of it but that's what organists do they have to go to a church at nighttime uh when no one's there and try and get some practice time yeah and that was uh, you mentioned in 2008 you went to see it but it wasn't until what 2015 where the idea came over over a couple of beers is that right you were yeah. in hong kong i think <laughs> And it wasn't my idea, which was really weird. So I was working on Shiners with uh, my cameraman, and we were having a drink after one of the shoots. And he's like, I'd like to do a film about that, you know, organ competition, just like completely out of the blue. And I'm like, oh, wow, well, I know the artistic director, and we can totally do this. This will be a great thing. I don't know why I didn't think of it. So... <laughs> So we ended up uh, working on that project, started in 2015, and we were filming the 2017 uh, CIOC. It happens every three years in Montreal, and actually the next one is coming up in October okay. of this year, 2020. Uh, God willing, I hope Yeah, it's fingers crossed. Up. Uh, and it's wonderful because it's free. So you can just drop in on the churches. You can come and go as you please, and it's wow. all free to the public. It's such a cool thing. No kidding. And you were saying young people. So how how young were the majority of the of the competitors? They have to be under thirty five. Is okay. the rule? So the youngest, who was actually in my film, is nineteen, uh, and he was the youngest person ever to have competed in it. It was quite extraordinary that he he made it in, and uh, the oldest was thirty thirty four. I think he was just okay. like. Uh, and then you started working on a new production and the pandemic came along. And as I understand, you were even filming some of this in Spain. So before we get to that story, which I'm sure is unique in, in, in itself, what, what was the new production you were working on? Uh, the new production is completely different, actually. It's, it's an, kind of an environmental film. Uh, <laughs> So it's called Scrap, and it's about uh, these sort of metal graveyards where things go when they're no longer useful. So planes, trains, ships. I filmed in a, um, you know, the red phone boxes from England. Like nobody's, yeah. using, nobody's using them anymore. So I filmed that. There's a graveyard in England. Um, and it's more about the people that are working with them and how they're recycling them or repurposing them in different ways. So I'm kind of following these different characters in different countries around the world so i went to i was in india uh actually the last shoot that i did i was in india thailand and spain so oh, okay it's, it's really a, ra a huge range of different kind of stories and people and another fascinating topic what, what was the inspiration <laughs> for the for this topic yeah it was just i was uh, maybe 10 years ago working on a tv show called uh, trashopolis which okay was discovery and it was about how um garbage builds cities or affected the history of cities basically it was a cool show and uh, I was researching something in Russia and there were these amazing locations in Russia where they had all the old rocket ships and old I don't know just kind of space stuff that they was they were no longer using right. and they were sort of scattered on the outskirts of, of uh, Moscow and I, I really like there were photographs from these places and I just thought these places are so cool like yeah. just visually and sort of what they have in terms of history and so I had that idea from that and then just eventually started looking into other areas 
things. Yeah, I can just, you know, as you're describing it, I can just imagine the cinematography of something exactly. like that. I mean, you just must have been like, this is a gold mine, right? Yeah, it's everything. It's like is walking great. into a candy store. Exactly, yeah. So for me, it was really like a visual thing. Uh, and there are a lot of people who are into those kind of like urban exploration is a big thing now. And if you go on Instagram, you'll see all these people that are exploring these kind of places. So I knew there was a fascination for these places. And uh, so that's kind of I was like, yeah, of course, it's going to be beautiful. So that was like number one. But then it was finding the characters too that uh, right. that, that I ended up really finding some interesting people. So where were you then when the pandemic hit? What, what was the situation like for you then? Well, it was kind of like I'd been monitoring it before I left. I left okay. in uh, February, like mid-February. Okay. And I knew I was going to Thailand, which Thailand had already started. Like it was one of the earlier countries that had started. And I was sort of monitoring it. And I knew India was still good at that point. So I was OK. Thailand, I was a bit worried. And then Spain, there was nothing in Spain really when I was planning the trip. And even when we were there, there was like maybe a hundred cases in all of Spain. So I was, I was like, okay, this should be safe and fine. And uh, and then we, the day we left, um, in we left on the 9th of March, and things okay. went like insane <laughs> on the 9th of March, as like right after we left. So we kind of got out, and then I came home and I flew to New York City. Okay. Uh, because I was supposed to have a meeting with a character on another film that I'm working on and everything was planned and I had this lunch plan with her in New York City and it was going to be fabulous. And then she's like, where, where have you been traveling? <laughs> and I'm like, Spain, you know, Spain. no problem. But I, I said, no, I'm like, there's no problem in Spain. There's only a hundred cases. And then I opened up like my internet and I was like, oh my God, like things went crazy overnight in Spain in like one day. So New York, I basically started self quarantine there. I was I was with my sister who lives there, and I didn't go out, and I just stayed inside in New York. Uh, and then I came home and I had to quarantine here. Well, let's talk about that other. You mentioned film and development, and I love the name of this. So I'm so intrigued of what this topic is going to be about. It's called Tough Old Broads. Tell me about this film. I'm really excited about it. Uh, so it's. Uh, it's about tough old broads, um, but what I'm looking at is kind of women that were ground breakers back in the day. So like the first right. woman to do X, Y, or Z. So let's say it's like seven, you know, in the 60s, 70s mostly, where women were starting to take on roles that were in male worlds, uh, and they were these ground breakers that made it possible for the rest of us. So I thought that was interesting in itself, these groundbreaking women. Um, and then, but now that they're older, what are they doing? Are they still vital? How are they looking back on how they were a woman then? And, you know, what they've learned in all these years and sort of, uh, so I was looking for these women that were still very tough and had sort of brought that spirit from when they were young and groundbreaking women into their old age. So uh, it's really interviewing these three women and looking at both their historic legacy, but also sort of what they're doing now. What a great premise. Oh, I can't wait to see that. That is going to be fantastic. Obviously, there's been a, a huge impact um, with the pandemic on, on, on the industry itself. I mean, you know, you work in the industry as I imagine everything's just come to a, a full stop. Is that where we stand right now in the film and television industry? Yeah, it's really tough, actually. Um, so, first of all, all productions have, have stopped. So there's not a single production. Like I'm in the middle of my production, and I can't and I, I can't do any shooting. I don't know when I'm going to be able to start working again. So it's just like completely ground to a halt. And then uh, they're kind of like, oh, well, you can still work on projects in development, right? Like you know that you're kind of thinking of, or you know, so. But it's been really hard, first of all, to get in touch with people, to be like, hey, do you want to make a documentary when they're home, kind of worried about their loved one? Like, yeah. it's just really been very awkward to even get new ideas off the ground. Um, so, you know, I'm trying to keep busy with my new ideas. <laughs> I have a lot of them. Um, but it, it's tough. It, it is. So, and obviously no money coming in. And then, yeah. you know, it's a huge industry in terms of like all of the camera people and like all everyone, every, everything that surrounds it. So everybody's out of work. Uh, there's really huge insecurity, um, 
in the industry and nobody knows when or how we're going to get back to work. Um, a lot of our jobs involve travel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, of course. You know, my films specifically involve a lot of travel. So airplanes, when's that going to happen? Uh, it's just a lot of question marks. So uh, I think it's not having an end date in sight that, I mean, I'm not the only one, but <laughs> yeah, no, of <laughs> not course, having but, an you know, end date in sight is, is problematic. And Stacey, I think the irony of it all is, you know, we've all turned to what? Entertainment, right? Yeah as this, you know, distraction that we need during times like this, you know, for, I know for a lot of people that, you know, I'm a sports fan, there's no sports, there's no live sports. So what do you turn to? You turn to television and movies, mm -hmm. you know, uh, all these productions have stopped me. Are we like, how long are we going to be in this situation? Are we going to get to the end of the internet and I've got nothing left to watch? You know what I mean? Like, exactly. what's going to happen? My goodness. How, about your, how about your own uh, mental state, your own mental health state? See, uh, how, how are you feeling? It's been really tough for me, actually. Uh, and I was surprised because I work from home regularly. So I'm like, oh, this isn't going to be a huge change. I work from home and it's going to be totally fine. Um, but it, it's, it, it ended up surprising me how hard it's been uh, on my mental state. And I think it's not necessarily the working from home or staying home that's a problem. But like I said, I'm usually working like 150% all day long, all the time. Like I'm just a busy person who loves their work too. So I think that's been the biggest shock is like, oh, I don't have work and I'm sort of depressed, which I, I never get depressed, right? <laughs> it's like, it's new and exciting for me. My husband's like, I'm always depressed. He's like, you know, <laughs> really, this is it, your first time? I'm like, yes, I don't know what to do with myself. I look out the window and it's raining like in those commercials. Um, yeah. So no, it's kind of weird for me. It's a weird... No, I, I relate. You know, I'm being in television for 15 <laughs> years, I mean... Uh... You know, as you explained right off the top, you know, it, it's a busy job. I mean, you're you're constantly on the go, even when, you know, your day is done in television, you know, in live television, which I was doing a three hour show. Well, once you when you get home, you're you're still working, right? You're still having to see, you know, what's happening in the world and being current and seeing what's breaking news is going on and preparing for the next day. And then all of a sudden, you know, since September, poof, I, it's the first time I haven't had a job in 35 years. So it's been a it's been a strange transition, and I thought it was okay in the beginning, right? Where well, I've been off since September. I'm I'm used to not working for a little while now, and this yeah. is just going to continue. But no, there's something different about obviously this situation than just you know being out of work because they they canceled your television show. Now, you know I can't see my mom and dad. You know I I can't. Uh, I'm a community person. I'm making money by doing you know professional speaking. All of those have been canceled. So yeah, I, I I relate to what you're what you're talking about. I love to be busy, hence the reason I decided to put together my own show from home because I I need this. I need to connect with people. Yeah, exactly for sure. It's well, Stacy, if uh, you know I'm out of work, so when things get back up and running, and you want to do that doorman documentary, you know. <laughs> I, I am available to help. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, tell everybody at home how they can how they can get in touch with you if they want to watch. I know Shriners, of course, uh, Shiners, okay. sh not Shriners. Shiners yeah. is available, of yeah. course. Uh, what's the best way for them to uh, to watch the documentary? Okay, first of all, they should get the documentary channel. Whether or not they want to watch my films or not, uh, it's just so amazing uh, to have that in Canada. It's pretty rare for a whole channel to be de devoted to documentary films. Yeah. Uh, you can just select it. It's not extra money. You can just select it as part of your cable package. Okay, uh, that's great. So the nice thing about the documentary channel is that they really keep people like me alive, right? So they have funded my first two films. Without them, my films would have never been made or brought into the world. So uh, I always recommend to people that they should be uh, watching the documentary channel, not only because it supports filmmakers, but also because they, they just show the best films. I mean, like there's really, really great films on documentary channel. Yeah. Uh, so that is amazing. So definitely get the doc channel. Both my films regularly screen there. Uh, and then also now CBC has a new initiative. Um, so doc channel is part of CBC. They're sort of a, um, yeah. a partnership. Uh, and doc, uh, CBC has this uh, new initiative with Hot Docs, the film festival, which is a documentary film festival that takes place in Toronto right now, uh, which is not taking place in Toronto right now. It's online. Right. 
Uh, so in order to show some of those films that were at Hot Docs or would have been at Hot Docs, CBC Gem is streaming them for free. Oh, excellent. Oh, so it's so cool. It's such yeah. a So um, both Shiners and Pipe Dreams are on that, as well as just a ton of other amazing films that were at Hot Docs or were supposed to be at Hot Docs this season. Uh, and Documentary uh, Channel, or is it CBC? I think Documentary Channel is also screening the current batch of films that were supposed to be at Hot Docs. Excellent. Well, Stacy, thank you so much for spending the time. I cannot wait to see the the other films that you have coming up. Uh, I know it's it's a difficult time for you, so I wish you and your your husband and you know your extended family all the best. Stay healthy and happy. Okay. Thanks so much. You too. All right. Take care. You too. Bye.